And I would like to welcome everyone to the second DigiBuild um, technical workshop. I am uh, Vittoria Cipollone from Università Politecnica delle Marche, and I'm a PhD student uh, in this university. And now I will briefly introduce you the DigiBuild project uh, together with the goals uh, of the technical workshop in which uh, you are involved today. So um, we can start uh, with a brief presentation of the objective of our project. DigiBuild is actually entitled High Quality Data Driven Services for a DigiBuild Built Environment Towards a Climate Neutral Building Stock. And in fact, the objective of this project is to provide, to develop and provide a toolbox which is open, interoperable and cloud-based in order to transform which are the um, traditional buildings uh, that we can find in our everyday lives uh, into smarter ones. In other words, uh, based on reliable data, specific algorithms, we would like to provide tools to digitalize the, the built environment. So let's see the concept of built environment digitalization. We can see here in the slide that uh, uh, built environment digitalization is a process that nowadays uh, is uh, um, touching uh, lots of uh, facilities, lots of buildings uh, that, as I said before, we encounter in our everyday activities. And in particular, the four main pillars uh, inside the concept of digitalization uh, are those. So starting from the fact that uh, a building can be digitalized through the installation of specific sensor network, for sure the main concept at this first part that I mentioned is uh, the concept of big data. So digitalization starts uh, from the collection of uh, several and uh, a high quantity of data that should be analyzed and processed uh, through specific techniques. Why? Because we are handling through the digitalization process, we, had, we are handling a big amount of data, data that should be of high quality because then, as you can see in the slide, they will be applied in algorithms and techniques that are based on artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithm techniques. These two uh, words, so artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, are actually nowadays present in lots of things, uh, lots of activities that we encounter in our, in our lives. So um, the BE digitalization is based on them uh, together with the data and the sensors that I mentioned because they help to forecast, so to predict, to measure, but also to optimize all those uh, uh, quantities that are related to the building itself. For sure, um, the outputs of these kind of algorithms are something that the end user may not understand or better uh, accept very well. And that is the reason why the last point of digitalization is the provision of proper user interfaces. So you can see here that dashboards, uh, the, the concept of digital twin, which is a version, a digital version of the building, are at the base uh, of this uh, digitalization process that nowadays is very common and that in the DigiBuild framework, in our project framework, is uh, fundamental. Another fundamental point that we actually infer from the last part of, this, of my discussion is uh, that uh, the central law of the user is uh, something that we should alight. In fact, uh, the um, digitalization effectiveness in a certain kind of building is uh, something that highly depends on the interaction of the user with the building itself. So for sure, the user should not in um, interfere with the, uh, all those technologies, all those sensors, all those algorithms that are running inside a building that is undergoing digitalization. And this implies, obviously, the proper uh, instruction that the um, technicians should provide to the end user. Moreover, technicians should also take into account the, in order to provide a, an effective digitalization process, all the user needs and requests in order to tailor the digitalization approach based on what actually the user needs in his or her life in the building. These concepts that I just show you are actually um, 
um, exploited in the DigiBuild framework. So in our project, DigiBuild, we, as I said before, we are trying to deploy a toolbox. So something, a, a set of services, data-driven services, so digital services that are specifically tailored on user requests and user, and user needs, which have been then translated into digitalization activities from us, that we are the, the technicians, we can say. So um, this implies obviously the need of a continuous interaction between the user and the building, so the digitalized environment. And this is possible thanks to the fact that in the DigiBuild framework, we will provide the tools that are obviously user-friendly in order to ease all the process. So to sum up all this concept here, I have reported the framework of the project itself. You can see here that uh, the product, the final product of the DigiBuild project uh, is this set of high quality data-driven services, which uh, are based on the main pillars that I mentioned before about digitalization of the built environment. These uh, services are actually a product, we can say, of the co-creation approach that you can see here in the slide. Co-creation approach is something that we have applied in the framework of our project to extract through a proper and a direct dialogue, dialogue with the stakeholder, as you can see in the slide, the user requirements and then the technical requirements and use cases that we have exploited for the uh, designing and the customization of the services that in fact DigiBuild then would like to deploy. The final output of these services application, as I said before, and as we can understand, is for sure the digitalization of a built environment. And here, once again, the user interaction uh, becomes pivotal. In fact, the services that I mentioned, the digital services that I mentioned, will provide all those information that the end user can exploit to uh, improve the surroundings from an energy point of view, but also a comfort point of view. So the end user in turn can act on the built environment and can, first of all, enhance the building performance, as I said before, from an energy point of view and also a sustainable point of view. And also improve in that way the stay, so the experience of the end user inside the built environment itself. All these concepts, I repeat it, are at the base of our project. And from a practical point of view, what we do is this. We deploy, we actually develop these high quality data driven services on 10 real life use cases. These use cases are spread all around Europe. In fact, eight countries are involved in our European project. We have so 10 pilot sites characterized by not only different kinds of buildings, schools, residential buildings, office buildings, but also um, they are characterized by different kinds of end users, different kinds of climatic zones. So they uh, enclose any kind of uh, options that the digitalization process uh, may encounter in uh, its application. So for sure, once again, I would like to uh, remark this concept, this importance of the user inside our project, because in DigiBuild, the deployment of the services that I mentioned are actually effective only if the user interacts with us. Okay. And that is the reason why um, this is at the base of the workshop uh, that uh, we are doing now. So we can say that uh, the aim of this uh, technical workshop, uh, which is in fact entitled User Engagement and so Social Acceptance, uh, is uh, the engagement of the user so that uh, we train them, we train you, the audience, to use our products, use our services, uh, and in fact, now during all the presentation that you, you um, will see today, we will explain the interaction of the user with the service. We will inform the user of all the technologies that we use in our, in our uh, technical developments. So as I said before, artificial intelligence, machine learning, data, everything that are inside the product that DigiBuild will have to deploy to you. And after that, at the end of all the presentations, the survey of social acceptance will be 
done will be provided to you in order to understand how the concept of DigiBuild are okay for you, in few words. At the end of it, obviously, all the instructions that you will see in our presentations will be translated into manuals. So will be translated into documentation that you can use to exploit eventually our, uh, our services, the DigiBuild tools. So um, before ending my presentation, I would like to spend a few words about the survey itself, because the survey you will see will be based on the social acceptance of three main concepts that are at the base of DigiBuild services. The digital twin, artificial intelligence and machine learning. The digital twin, as I already mentioned, is a tool, a digital tool that represents the digital version of the building, which can be interactive for the user. And inside of it, actually, you potentially find the services that the DigiBuild deploy. Machine learning and artificial intelligence instead are the techniques that we develop, that we in, in, in apply in order to uh, deploy then uh, the services that I mentioned before. So um, inside the survey, you will find questions about all these technical aspects that will be actually uh, clearly uh, explained during this workshop. So I end my presentation with the agenda. So I ended up at the first 10 minutes of presentation and I will leave, leave the floor to the next presenters that will show, first of all, Work Package 2 um, concepts. Work Package 2 is a part of our DigiBuild project um, uh, dedicated to data. Then we will see Work Package 3, that is instead the part of the, our project dedicated to the services, to the DigiBuild services. And last but not least, we will see in Work Package 4, the digital twin. After that, the conclusion of the technical workshop will be the survey of social acceptance, as I mentioned before. So uh, if anyone has any question, I would like to leave the floor to Jose Hernandez from Cartif so that he can better explain data, big data, and provide you awareness about them and how we use this data in the DigiBuild concept. So uh, thank you very much. I don't know if from the chat there are some question. Okay. I can uh, stop sharing my screen. I leave the floor to Jose. Okay, hello, good morning everyone. Victoria for for the presentation and, and yeah and okay I think that the presentation is already here. Let me start in to the stream mode. Okay. Okay. So again, uh, good morning everyone. So I'm Jose Luis Armando from from Cartif and I will I would like to provide you some insights about the data, why data is important and why data is enabled. Uh, enabling the different services that will be presented afterwards. So in this sense, uh, let me thank also to the uh, entities that has collaborated in this work, like Engineering, University College of London, and uh, Technical University of, of Athens, that are contributing to this part. In this sense, uh, what I would like to present today is as to provide you an overview about what is a data lake, uh, why this data is important and why data quality is important in the in the data management, the benefits that we have with Data Lake in order to provide this kind of awareness and and training uh, for for the audience, and finally a key tip uh, or a key message that is important in the digitalization of buildings and data collecting. So the Data Lake, uh, let me start with uh, with our concept in the Data Lake where we have a federated data lake. So this means a uh, data, data lake that is focused on different businesses within the building, combining heterogeneous data sources and providing standard data models in order to provide a uniform uh, streaming data to be shared with different services and different information. This is extremely important because we have different formats of data in the different uh, data sources that we have in buildings. And we need to share the information in a common way because otherwise it is very uh, it's very difficult to understand 
and interpret the data, and then this data is not is useless. So this is why it's important to have this kind of combination and uniform data. It can be interpreted in, in three ways that we have multiple data sources where we have, as I mentioned before, the heterogeneous data samples. And for that reason, we need extraction, transformation, and loading ETLs processes that will combine three main data sources that we have in our buildings. Dyn dynamic data sources that mainly comes from the sensors, the static sources that are represented by documents like BIM, uh, energy performance certificates, uh, or other kind of documents that we have in the buildings that provide contextual information around the sensors, like location of the sensor, geolocation, uh, energy uh, features of the building or whatever. And external data that uh, usually can be translated into climate services from external services that provide us insights about climate, climate conditions around the building. But we can uh, take into consideration other kind of external data like data spaces around the world or Eurostat web page or other external data that can be useful for providing services. But it, it is not only about multiple data sources, but also, as I mentioned before, having a common data model because we need to harmonize this data in order to provide a common data representation in order to share data in a uniform way. This is very important because otherwise we will have different, not only these three, uh, that sources that I mentioned before, but formats can be really, really different. And then this combination is really important to provide a simplification of the data in order to uh, use this data in the proper way. And for that, uh, this bill has provided an ontology that uh, is able to simplify and combine all this information to provide this harmonized view of the data. Last but not least, the building business intelligence that the uh, data lake is not only just a repository of data it's also a kind of pre-analytics of data in, in form of data marts that provides aggregated data in order to uh, obtain building insights already from the data that we have by the combination of the different data following a user-centric approach and this is very important because data marts can be configured and customized according to the user needs you, uh, understanding user as the, the data consumer from the services, the graphical user interface to provide data to the users or other kind of users that can consume data from our data lake. So in this sense, the users can just consume the data that is needed for the uh, purpose of the, of the service or whatever uh, part. In a simplified way, uh, our data lake looks like this. Uh, we have the ETLs, as I mentioned before, to collect the data and then to provide the information into repositories, the dynamic and static repositories that sync among them because this is very important to keep the coherence of data. And the data marks, as I mentioned before, it providing uh, different businesses for a perspective of the buildings. That's why we represent here multiple data marks because we can have multiple businesses within the building in order to provide information for the services, the digital twins, or the graphical interface for the final users. At the end, the users will be at the beginning of the process, but also at the end of the process. So that's why users are very important in all this process. And let me pass to the importance of data quality. So we have data, but we are providing services based on which level of quality of data. So for that then, uh, in our Analysis, analysis, we detected that the data quality is not very high at the end. So we are providing uh, services that provide uncertainties. So for that, for that end, uh, we provide a couple of methodologies to improve the data quality. First of all, to check the data quality uh, that we have in our data sets. We have a couple of uh, processes within this methodology. The, the data quality, first of all, is one that's automated, that in the ETL itself, we are able to detect different in indicators uh, about the data quality. But the most important one from the user perspective, that is that the an, uh, user interface where you are able to collect, to input, ingest the data that you have uh, in your building, and then to determine which is the real um, data quality according to the different conditions of your building. Uh, 
independently of the format, independently of the of the data, that this process is able to standardize uh, the information based on configuration files, and then a user can check what is the real data quality that we have in buildings. And secondly, we are able to correct this data and, and create data imputation methods that will increase this data quality that you can see quality in buildings, in our buildings, in our pilots, in this case, in the GBIL, are very diverse. We have, um, in, in some cases, indicators with a very high level of uh, data quality, but we have others that are not with this high quality of, of data, let's say medium quality of data, and should be improved in order to make decisions. Decisions uh, relies on data, and then if we take decisions based on this uh, quality of data, we can have some mistakes or some uncertainties. Then, having said that, which are the benefits of the of having a data lake? Well, first of all, uh, having the digital ontology uh, and this kind of processes, we can integrate different data from dynamic and static context, and then enriching the, dynam the dynamic data with contextual data, and then querying just the relevant data and metadata that we need to increase our, uh, our service development. Sense. Let me pass this part uh, because here, as I mentioned before, we have this unified data with the time series data that we have from the sensor, and then we are able to provide this information in a uniform way to the services. Secondly, uh, we have at the moment silos in our building, so this means we have one building, one service, one building, one service. While in our approach, we have this uh, kind of um, methodology like develop once and deploy anywhere. So this means that we have multiple buildings with different sensors uh, data, with different contextual data, and we are able to provide services that allow us to connect different buildings and provide services according to the context of this building. So this means that uh, we save uh, our efforts but we provide replication services for the, for the users. So you can use the same service in different pilots, in different buildings, or in different contexts by using our data lake. But also, uh, we are able to combine this kind of information in different phases of the, of the building operation uh, that design of, of the maintenance part, and then by querying the data, oops, are you seeing the black screen? Yeah, it is black, Jose. Okay, let me start again because I don't know why suddenly it was um, black. Okay, I don't know why. Okay, now. Okay, sorry, sorry for that. So as I mentioned before, having this uh, uniform um, Data model, we are able to query this information in order to provide different data, data driven services like KPIs, key performance indicators, uh, performance monitoring, and benchmarking of our, day, our uh, energy, for instance, of the energy consumption of the buildings. Services uh, are, uh, or, or this data is allowing us to, to do this kind of services. So, some examples of these services is um, KPIs, like I mentioned before, or performance uh, um, monitoring that will provide us better informed decisions because we can make decisions by, uh, by correlating different information. For instance, you can see here in the in the this kind of services for monitoring on, on, and to make decisions about the consume energy in a building according to the climate conditions by different months of the of the year. So, in this sense, we can make decisions based. On this information that usually is not correlated in our sensor networks, but also we can have like uh, analytics dashboards, like the, the the one showing the in the screen, where we can see different buildings and uh, we can make decisions about uh, planning of the different districts, or we can uh, know about the satisfaction of the citizens. So we can combine multiple information to provide this kind of dashboards in order to make decisions in uh, strategically in the companies or in the cities or in the buildings or whatever. But also we can provide this kind of added value services because, because we can see the patterns of the our buildings uh, about how the buildings are behaving 
in order to to detect patterns of energy consumption of data like this uh, this case so in this in this sense we can see that our building will consume more or less uh, energy according to the climate conditions so in this sense providing more insights about what the building or how the building operates so these are just examples of uh, services but later on my colleagues will show uh, the services that are part of the of the dg build project just here uh, highlighting the benefit that uh, having a data lake could have and to finalize let me uh, share a or a key message that this data today is the oil of our world so everything is data data and data so we have in the in the world we are creating a lot of data sets so that's why data is the oil of the 21st century but this data should be properly used we are collecting data in all the systems that we have but why where how and to whom so this is very important to know which is the impact of the data and why we need this data and which will be the final use of this data so this is important let's keep the data um, and we let's keep uh, the digitalization of, of the info of the information but let's use the data in the proper manner so with this uh, key message I, fi I finished my presentation thank you very much so you have any question any comment I'm happy to answer so if not maybe Victoria we can pass to the next Yes, exactly. So thank you, Jose, for your presentation. Uh, to the audience, if you have any question, you can also put it in the chat uh, and maybe we can respond it uh, a little bit later. So uh, I leave the floor to Edith Selsarmas from NQA for the presentation of Work Package 3. And then uh, we will see service by service uh, all the technologies deployed in this work package of DigiBuild project. Thank you. Hello, good morning from my side as well. Uh, let me open my camera also. Okay, I hope you can see me. Uh, and now you will allow me to share my screen. Okay. Uh, I hope that you can see my screen as well. Uh, thank you all of you for your attendance today. I see several familiar faces, uh, same with the first workshop. Uh, so I'm very happy that you keep following our activities and you're interested in our developments. I see also some members of our transdisciplinary board uh, we're very glad to have you here as well. And you know that your feedback and your opinion on our development, either now or offline, is always very welcome uh, and help, helps us improve. And uh, this presentation serves as an introduction to a series of demos that we're going to present to you related to the AI-based data-driven services that we have developed. Uh, these services are uh, tailored to certain buildings uh, among our pilots. So uh, where does this presentation place among the several developments in our project? As you can see in the blue box, uh, the aim of, uh, of this, let's say, um, presentation is to show you the, the series of services, algorithms, models, APIs, and graphical user interfaces that we have developed exploiting several high quality data, big data many times, uh, responding also to the needs of specific stakeholders in the building sector. So we aim to satisfy their user requirements to address certain use cases that we have developed uh, across uh, nine pilots uh, all over Europe and to provide some services that will be integrated to digital twins of buildings uh, so that they can uh, bring impact in the in the occupational stage and in the in the everyday 
uh, work and uh, flow of the building's operation. So we're going to show you services uh, split in five pillars, services related to energy profiling and forecasting, services related to energy resources management, including flexible loads, services related to enhanced comfort and people well-being, services and simulation tools related to renovation roadmaps and to energy efficiency financing, and also uh, services that address the problem of climate resilient buildings, which is a quite challenging uh, problem also uh, given the situation of the climate crisis and the, the, the needs of, of our uh, countries, uh, especially during summers. So all these pillars um, are split into 15 services, 15 distinct services. Of course, we're, we're not going to show you all 15 of them, but uh, we're going to show you five demo cases uh, split across 10 pilots. So uh, some few things about uh, the developments in, in each of the of the services. We have some profiling forecasting services related to learning, transfer learning used for building demand forecasting, for flexibility forecasting, for renewables forecasting, especially PVs, and for thermal comfort using algorithms such as neural networks, incremental learning, and deep learning. Then we have data-driven services related to energy resources management. So we use flexible loads such as batteries, EV charging stations, flexible demands of buildings like the HVAC equipment. And we aim to optimize the situation of the buildings with optimization algorithms, heuristic algorithms, as well as with reinforcement learning. Then we have services related to comfort. So we introduce the comfort performance contract. Of course, you'll see more of it in, uh, in the demo. This is a contract that aims to, to achieve a balance between energy savings and uh, user comfort. Then we have some services related to energy efficiency. So we, we have a catalog tailored to building energy efficiency actions. And then through simulation tools like Energy Plus, which have been highly customized, we, we propose and we recommend uh, the best possible energy efficiency actions to perform in a, in a building and relatively old building. Then we have decision-making tools under uncertainty. So uh, we aim to address climate factors, uh, which are aimed to, to achieve a better climate resiliency in buildings. Uh, on the one side, we have the building design. So we address construction materials, thermal transmitters, coefficients, and the shading of the buildings. And on the other side, we delve into the building systems like heating, cooling, renewable energy sources, or any other stuff that would make the, the building more smart, let's say. We, of course, all of us here know the uh, smart readiness indicator as well, which is a good sign of how smart and how ready a building is to adopt these uh, new technologies. To sum up, and before proceeding to the demos of the service developers of this build, I would like to make a short, let's say, recap of what has been developed here. You can see several services, several methods. Um, here are the problems that we are solving. And someone could split them into four distinct categories, like advanced monitoring and benchmarking, energy consumption, production forecasting, resource management and optimization, and comfort and carbon footprint estimation. So I think that's all from my side. And let's go to the interesting part of the demos. I don't want to take much of your time with presentations since we have some concrete results to show. So please, Victoria, you can give the floor to the respective demo presenters. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, we can start uh, with the first uh, service, uh, the one related to the um, task 3.1 uh, um, uh, task of the of the of the project and uh, specifically <laughs> I'm the floor to um, Daniela thank you Victoria okay let me share my screen and we can start okay so um, 
Hello everyone, I'm Daniela Stoyan from NTUA and I will talk to you about our AI-based service for finer grained energy profiling and forecasting. So, um, of course, there is a great need for informed decision-making tools, especially in buildings, and we need to minimize our uncertainty with methods like forecasting. Um, there is also a need for advice on consumer behavior so that we can um, make it even more efficient. By taking all of these into account, we have created a user-friendly web tool for HVAC systems management. Uh, with this tool, we provide decision-making support for system upgrading, and we also um, provide consumer behavior monitoring and recommendations so that we can um, optimize it even more. Uh, by using this tool, the user uh, can monitor and improve the energy consumption of the HVAC systems in their building. Um, the, the service also provides upgrading solutions for optimal energy uh, and cost efficiency. And of course, the user can then visualize and improve the consumer usage patterns to achieve even more uh, energy and cost savings. Okay, so let's take a look at how this service works. Um, this service uses uh, data from AC sensors as an input and more specifically, in order for it to work, we need the uh, energy consumption of the AC and the temperature inside and outside of the room. Uh, we also require some information from the user, which is the sear scope AC capacity of the AC that they want to use to replace an older one. And we also need the energy cost. Uh, by using algorithms that we have developed and some models that we have trained, we calculate the following KPIs. First of all, we calculate the operating hours of the AC for heating and cooling separately. We calculate the electricity consumption um, before with the old AC and after <clears throat> the AC replacement has taken place. Uh, we also calculate the monetary cost of uh, operation and investment. And uh, most importantly, we calculate the payback period uh, so that the user can then uh, get insight into whether the uh, AC replacement will be profitable or not, and if they should in fact replace the specific AC. Uh, by using our um, trained models, we also calculate uh, the comfort percentage of the user uh, based on their behavior and on the PMV. And we, uh, with our trained models, we uh, make simulations uh, with the new AC and we also make simulations for the optimal usage so that the uh, uh, user can understand if they can improve their uh, usage behavior uh, and patterns and perhaps achieve even more energy and cost savings from that as well. Uh, we can also see here an overview of our service interface. On the top left, we can see our dashboard with all the ACs. And then the bottom, we can see some uh, information that the service provides for uh, each AC unit. And on the right, we can see how the simulations look like and the results of uh, the um, AC replacement. Of course, uh, you will see this later in more detail in the demo, and you will also understand a little bit better how, how the service works and how the user can interact with it. So uh, thank you very much for your time. That's it for my presentation. Uh, again, I think that uh, you will understand a lot better how the service works in the demo that I will show you. And perhaps then we can continue with a discussion and more questions. So uh, let me share the demo. OK, here you are. I will now play it. DigiBuild offers an AI-based service for finer grained energy profiling and forecasting. This service can assist users in decision-making regarding HVAC system upgrades, providing solutions for optimal energy and cost efficiency. 
Additionally, the service enables consumer behavior monitoring and visualization, as well as usage simulation and recommendations to help achieve further cost reduction. When entering the app, the user is greeted by the dashboard where all registered AC systems can be viewed. By clicking on an AC unit, a pop-up shows up that displays information regarding the AC and the room it operates in. In the top right corner, users can view a graph illustrating the average monthly temperatures both inside and outside the room. This provides valuable insights into temperature consistency within acceptable bounds. Considering that thermal comfort is influenced by factors like humidity and airspeed, the graph in the bottom right corner illustrates the thermal comfort using PMV indicator, which should ideally fall within the range of minus 0.5 to 0.5. In the example below, the PMV mostly remains within this range, resulting in a high comfort percentage. Additionally, the graph displays the total energy consumed for heating and cooling, which as expected increases during winter and summer months. Regarding operational information, the algorithm calculates the actual heating and cooling hours and total electricity consumption for the given period. These values serve as primary inputs for the analysis conducted to determine the profits of AC replacement. Users can enter the AC specifications in the list on the left. Moving forward, users can visualize the expected energy and monetary savings based on the previous inputs and estimated heating and cooling hours for each room. The last column shows the expected payback time, color-coded for easy interpretation, green for approval, yellow for consideration, and red for decline. With this information, the user can have a better overview of the AC usage and how a new one can affect the energy consumption and savings, thus allowing them to effortlessly decide about which AC systems should be replaced. In the following section, users can evaluate AC usage by viewing the mean and standard PMV for each AC unit. As previously noted, the mean PMV should be close to zero and within the range of minus 0.5 to 0.5 The for script comfort. also provides detailed information about the comfort percentage during occupancy hours. By clicking the simulate button, users can observe the expected PMV after the replacement has occurred. In this example for the month of June, the simulated PMV is closer to zero than the actual one. The user can also view the optimal usage for the AC and how the annual savings and comfort levels are affected by it. This tool assists in evaluating AC usage and aids in decision making regarding replacement and optimal usage. It empowers users to make informed and profitable decisions while gaining a better understanding of their AC systems operation. Thank you for watching. Okay, thank you for watching again, and I'm ready to answer any questions that you might have. I, of course, I you can... You... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Please uh, you can uh, also type any questions in the chat, and perhaps we can revisit them later. It's it's okay. Okay. So I think that we can move on with Andrea from uh, engineering for the next presentation. He will present a service related to the Digibil Task three point two. So please, Andrea, share your screen and yes, go I'm on. Sharing right Thank now. You. Okay, I hope you can see the screen and hear me and see me loud and clear. I'm Andrea Dalini, a software developer for uh, Engineering Engineering Informatica, and I will present you the service that we are developing for optimal management of uh, uh, district heating networks uh, in order to improve production efficiency and reducing the costs. So basically, uh, 
our service was uh, determined in the first place uh, as a, a tool to uh, optimize the uh, the managing of the district heating networks. So basically, what we aim is uh, to uh, let's say uh, efficiently manage the different heating sources that a district heating network may have in order to enable the facility manager to uh, um, reduce costs, uh, reduce uh, natural gas consumptions, and also to efficiently use the, heating, the different heating sources. Uh, the algorithm will return, of course, uh, different optimization strategies basing on the data that it, it, it takes from, uh, from as input. Uh, and the manager, the facility manager, will have the possibility to see uh, the real situation uh, of the district heating network through the digital twin, that you will see also in the demo uh, later on. Um, the model is based on a machine learning uh, gradient boosted algorithm, uh, which is uh, used to uh, predict some values, some consumption values, uh, to estimate some consumption values that are injected also into a genetic algorithm in order to optimize the different data, data source, sources. The main benefits and advantages that the user may have from this service, let's say are on both sides of, of the chain. We have some advantage for the district heating network manager and some advantages, of course, from for, for the end user of the of the uh, the, the heating power. So we aim at reducing natural gas consumption, as I said before, by efficiently managing the heating sources. In the case of the pilot that we are uh, that we are using, we have, for example, three boilers to manage. Re the reduction of CO two emi emissions granted, of course, by the less uh, the, the less gas consumption, and also the the cost reduction on both sides of the chain, as I was saying before. So the district heating manager we have. Uh, we'll have to pay less for the gas that he's, he's using, and also the end user will have to pay less for the for the heating power. And also, uh, we aim at uh, uh, increase the efficiency of uh, complex networks, such as uh, uh, the the one that we are uh, that we are uh, developing this service for. And one primary aim also of this service uh, was the ease of usage. Uh, for the user. In this case, the primary user of this service will be the district heating network manager. So we plan the service to be uh, user friendly uh, from the first instances of the of the development stages. Um, and the service will be uh, exploited easily through the digital twin. So uh, in terms of inputs, uh, the model does not require any particular input from the from the from the manager uh, simply because uh, uh, from the, it takes it automatically takes data da, data from the data lake that uh, also Jose showed before and uh, with this data with this automatic collection of data it updates the model with the new information and the model returns uh, the optimization strategy for the following 24 hours uh, this is one of uh, the main features uh, let's say of the of the service since uh, it, it's easy to use simply because the user does not have to input anything or to uh, set complex calculation and the service almost uh, runs automatically every time the digital twin is uh, is uh, accessed so you have you have also always new information each time you access the digital twin and in terms of results, uh, we can see here that, uh, as I was saying before, the service uh, returns a list of temperature for each 30 minutes of the following, the following 24 hours, so the following day. And the only thing that the user, in this case, the manager needs to do is to apply those temperatures to the boilers in order to achieve the projected savings. As we can see from the from the table here, different temperatures for for different uh, uh, slots uh, for different slots can of course improve the uh, quality of the of the heating irrigated through the heating sources, and we can see also from the from the from the graph that we have a significant reduction in cost and in the usage of the uh, the, the natural gas to produce the the, the heating power. 
this is uh, just a slide of uh, just an, anticipa an anticipation of what you will see in the demo. This service uh, does not have uh, a specific graphical user interface per se, but it's mainly used through the digital twin. So the demo of this service will be shown later on during the digital twin demonstration. But uh, just to give you a, um, a quick overview, we can see that we have some relevant metrics as a result of the of the of the simulation in the top bar. So the natural gas consumption, uh, the total gas consumption uh, based on historical data, the optimized gas consumption, the savings and the saved cost. And below in the plot, uh, you can see the same temperature that we see before in the in the table uh, in, in a graph, depicting the situation uh, that needs to be applied in order to achieve the measures that are reported uh, um, that are reported in the in the top bar. So as I was saying, uh, to conclude, we had significant results from this service, and this service also shows uh, uh, very important possibilities to aid the district heating network manager to reduce gas consumptions and cost and, and to efficiently manage the, the district uh, the district heating networks and uh, associated with uh, with the ease of use uh, through the digital twin uh, this service uh, is a valuable tool uh, to let's say uh, reduce uh, our carbon footprint footprint and efficiently manage our energy energy sources so the demo you will see the demo also in the in the in the next section and uh, maybe it will be more clear uh, how to use the the, the service. So I uh, thank you for now. Uh, that's all. If you have any question, I'm here uh, open to answer them. As I was saying, as 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 I said before. The question you should you should also put the question in the chat and I will answer later on during the workshop, of course. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I think that we can go on. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you, Andrea. And I will that's my turn. So I will leave the floor to myself, actually. So I will share my screen with the next service, which is related to comfort. So one second. Okay. I hope you can uh, see my screen. Well, um, the service is uh, related to comfort. In fact, uh, as you can see here in the first introductory um, slide, it is entitled Enhanced Comfort and Wellbeing. Specifically, as also mentioned in the introductory part of this work package, um, this uh, um, service aims at designing and implementing artificial intelligence-based model for comfort quantification, not only starting from the classic and traditional environmental data, which are at the basis of the comfort evaluation, but also considering the user feedback, because I will just uh, tell you in a while, comfort highly depends on the subjectivity of the user. So user feedback is fundamental to improve its quantification. Together with that, also optimization algorithms are included in the service because we would like to connect comfort maintenance with the energy efficiency of the building, given the fact that they highly correlate each other. Together with the fact that we can say that one of the final results of this service is the so-called coaching solution, which puts the user at the center of the whole measuring process. Since uh, um, if on one hand, as I said before, the user feedback is fundamental for comfort quantification. On the other hand, the models that we implement in the framework of this service will provide the proper output to the end user to act on the environment and maintain comfort. So as a consequence, you can see here in the slide on the right that the three main concepts inside our service are artificial intelligence, user, and energy efficiency. 
Artificial intelligence, as I said, is used to predict comfort because it helps to have a future uh, quantification of comfort to tailor specific actions on the environment to maintain it or to improve it, obviously. Um, the user is another point, a fundamental point, because as I mentioned before, uh, comfort is an heterogeneous quantity. It depends on the environment, so indoor temperature, relative humidity, light, and so on. But it highly depends on the subjectivity and also the physiology of the human being. So the user is a pivotal for its evaluation, and that is the reason why we ask to the user some feedbacks about that. Last but not least, energy efficiency. Obviously, we connect the comfort to the building in this way. So maintaining comfort or better uh, applying this service should not only maintain comfort, but should maintain comfort at a certain energy cost at a certain energy level, providing a proper an enhancement in the building performance in terms of energy. So this is uh, the overview of uh, uh, our comfort service, uh, how it works. Uh, it works in this way. So this is a flow of the input output of the whole uh, procedure. We have on the left, uh, the inputs. So you see that our service will take as input, uh, as I said, environmental factors, uh, user feedback, uh, energy data, and weather data. These uh, inputs will fed uh, AI, so artificial intelligence algorithms that will provide us predictions. Specifically on the slide, you can see that the outputs will be the predicted comfort level, but also an optimal set point temperature. Optimal because it is the temperature that should maintain comfort at a certain energy level, which ensure a proper energy um, consumption and thus energy cost. These kind of outputs uh, that may be not so user friendly are then put in a visualization in some of the visualization tools that I will show you in a while. Because then, as I already mentioned, the user action is needed. So once our algorithms provides the output to your user through the visualization tools, the user should be able to act on the environment. For instance, if the prediction of comfort coming from the artificial intelligence points out a future uh, uh, cold condition, so in the future people will be in discomfort, then the action that the user should apply in the environment is, for instance, raising up the temperature, taking into account the optimal set, po set point. So we can say that uh, the key points uh, at the base of this flow and at the base of the whole service uh, are for sure the user feedback, uh, the user action provided as recommendations, through the visualization tools and then artificial intelligence. So now I will show you two of the visualization tools that we implement in this uh, context, given that the visualization tool is actually the bridge between what we technically develop and what the user should, should exploit to act on the environment and provide a proper comfort level. So, um, the first visualization tool is this web page, is a user feedback collection tool. So uh, here the target user is the occupant of the building. So for instance, in an office building, it is the worker. And the aim at this point is to collect the information that you can see here. Actually, among all this information, the feedback that we require the, that we require to the user is the thermal sensation vote that you can see in the, the table uh, in this slide on the left, which is a number that goes from plus three to minus three passing from zero, representing the thermal sensation of the person. And that this, um, um, this um, feedback should be actually updated every hour in this uh, web page that is accessible to the link that you can see here in the slide. This kind of approach then will be also applied to provide a recommendation to the occupants. And after that, uh, I will show you instead the dashboard. The dashboard that we will have to deploy in Digible in this comfort service uh, um, is uh, uh, dedicated to a user such as a facility manager. 
In this case, in fact, the dashboard that you can see in the right on the right of the slide provides not only an overview of all the environmental elements of the building, but also future comfort levels, future um, energy levels, and so on. And uh, in particular, what will happen now, um, when the end user acts through this dashboard is this. You have the dashboard, the facility manager, so the end user select a date, so the report that he or she will visualize will uh, uh, regard the uh, 30 days starting from the selected date, and uh, all this information will come out. So environmental factors, but also uh, future information about comfort level and energy uh, related information will be shown. Together with that, we have a part on the dashboard dedicated to the recommendation. For sure, um, uh, one of the pivotal point is, as I said before, the action on the, um, on the environment. So here in the dashboard, the user will be able to see all the action that should be applied in order to uh, provide a proper comfort level at a certain energy uh, cost. Last but not least, in the dashboard, also the so-called key performance indicators will be present. Why? Because the KPIs are percentages, so um, quantification of the effectiveness of the service. In that way, the end user is aware of how the service, the comfort service, is going uh, through the application of it in the building, so that he is aware of how it's going everything. So this is uh, more or less the overview of the dashboard that actually I will show you in a, a brief video at the end of the presentation. This is how the dashboard looks. So you have a part dedicated to environmental data, a part dedicated to the statistics with the KPI, a part dedicated to the um, comfort, and last but not least, the recommendation part. So uh, I conclude my presentation with a some advantages for the building and benefits for the users. You can see that obviously for the building we have advantages because we have with application of this service the improvement and also the maintenance of a proper comfort condition that satisfy the user, satisfy the occupants. Together with that, an enhancement of energy efficiency is for sure guaranteed together with a, redu a reduction of the energy costs. Also because uh, thanks to the recommendation that we would like to provide to the end user, a smarter usage of all the um, um, electric consuming device uh, should be applied so that comfort is maintained, but also energy uh, consumption is uh, reduced. Together with that, for the user instead, we have for sure a higher quality of people will be inside the facility together with a proper improvement of the work productivity if we are talking about an office building and then the awareness of the of the sorry of the user inside the building and the awareness of the digitalization process that the building is undergoing is for sure guaranteed by this service given the central role with the coaching solution that the user has so I leave you with a brief take home message uh, about this service. This service, the Comfort One, needs an active collaboration of the users with us because uh, on one hand, as I said before, the user feedback uh, is crucial for the implementation of the models of the artificial intelligence models. And on the other hand, we have the actions, so the user actions that instead are pivotal to improve the building from an energy point of view and also maintain or improve the comfort level. So before some questions, if they are any, uh, I thank you all and I will show you a brief video of the, um, of the dashboard. So just one moment, I will share again my screen. And I hope that uh, you can 
listen to it. The DigiBit dashboard is a tool designed to provide recommendations and feedback to the user. Uh, the first page, as you can see, is dedicated to the environmental data and display the key metrics such as the indoor and outdoor temperatures, the relative humidity, and the carbon dioxide levels measured over a specific time period in various rooms. The strength of this tool lies in, in its flexibility. In fact, user can select specific rooms uh, of interest for detailed measurements and adjust the time interval according to their uh, preferences. Currently, you are viewing historical data from the Foki pilot, but in the final version, real-time data will be seamless integrated. Moving on to the second page, we find the SPMV values and a comparative analysis between the predicted and the actual SPMV over a 24-hour period. And this includes also um, metrics such as the mean absolute error and the mean squared error, providing insights into the accuracy of the predicted, predictive model. The third page of the dashboard uh, is dedicated to showing statistics. Here uh, we find uh, the minimum and the maximum uh, values for the measured parameters across different rooms and some key performance indicators related, uh, for example, to the indoor uh, air quality and the thermal comfort, as well as uh, the energy consumption uh, data. Finally, on the last tab of the dashboard, um, we delve into recommendations and actions. This section, in fact, provides users with uh, valuable insights and suggestions to ensure the optimal comfort level and the energy efficiency. So by leveraging the data-driven recommendations, the user can make informed decisions to enhance the overall uh, building environment. Okay. Thank you, have any question i'm here otherwise you can put it in the chat as we uh, said before okay otherwise i leave the floor to the next presenter dimitra thank you hi hello everyone i i hope you can see me and hear me clear let me share my presentation Okay, so uh, hello everyone. My name is Dimitra Zani and I'm a researcher from the uh, IECP and I will present you today the Energy Efficiency Financing and Policy Making Service. All in all, the starting point for this service uh, was the need of the users for informed decision making tools for the renovation in buildings. What we mean about this is that we wanted to show the users what are the potential energy savings for different energy efficiency measures and also packages of measures for the specific building applications and also to provide them with advice and financing options in order to be able to proceed with um, renovation measures that they would like to see in their buildings. Uh, what we do in order to facilitate the users on this side is to evaluate the energy savings in buildings using a simulation model that I will show you later, later and also in the demo video that I will present to you. Uh, afterwards, we proceed with a techno-economic assessment of the renovation packages using different um, indices like the NPV, the payback period, and the levelized cost of saved energies. And the last thing that's currently under development is that we're developing a user-friendly environment in order to collect the data from the users and facilitate them access the service and provide them the feedback from the service uh, results. Uh, all in all, the benefits of the users uh, from the service is the, vis the visualization of the energy consumption before and after the renovation packages, the provision of the cost-effectiveness of different solutions, so we also provide them recommendations when it is affordable for them to go for some solutions and when it is not. The provision of information on available financing and funding, funding options depending on the type of the building that they have and the availability of the different programs in the regions. And um, another key result is that um, apart from uh, collecting the data from the users, no expertise is going to need it from their side in the simulation or in the reading of the results, everything will be provided from the service. 
uh, a little bit about the service input. Um, we need two key information in order to proceed um, with the simulation of the buildings. The first one is the building characteristics. We need the um, very specific characteristics about the building typology, for example, the total area of the floor, the total area of the external walls, like in the total area of the roof and the windows. We also need the U values of the different features of the building, uh, as they're very important for us to see the differences before and after the renovation. And of course, we need information from the users about the heating and the cooling systems and other equipment, for example, the lighting that they have in their building in order to proceed with simulating their consumption. The other thing that uh, we need, uh, it, this will be uh, both these um, inputs are currently developed in a user interface to make it even more easier for the user to fill them in. So this will be the renovation measures catalog. This will be a checklist and the user will be able to choose which of the measures he would like to test for his building or her building. For example, the replacement of the boiler, the replacement of double glazed windows with tripled ones, etc. The categories here will be three, the building envelope, the HVAC systems and other. And these are some uh, just indicative, more will be included in the final uh, user interface. Um, all in all, just to help you understand the user interaction, uh, for us, it's very important to get this feedback from the users. Otherwise, we cannot uh, simulate their buildings and provide them with a recommendation. So the starting point is collecting the building characteristics and also the renovation measures that the users would like to um, test in their building applications. Uh, so this is the first step, and it's the major step that the um, users will be needed with their contribution. Afterwards, it's mainly the DigiBuild experts that uh, we will do the simulation and the financial analysis. And this part will be better explained also during the demo. That's why I will not go into details about the model now, as you will see it in more detail. And uh, afterwards, what we do is that we synthesize the results and we develop recommendations. We see which of the measures are cost effective, which of the measures are uh, have very high energy saving potential for the users. And then we synthesize all these results into a building renovation roadmap. In this roadmap, um, not only the results, but also the funding options that the user can use and how much it will cost them or how much it will save them to use these services will be included. And then we send this report back to the users. So mainly this is the interface that we are currently developing. Um, and this is a final output, but I think you will also see this one better in the demo in more detail. Some of the results that we extract for our, from our service is the total energy consumption before we do the measures and after we do the measures in the building. These are actual results from a um, digital pilot in uh, Athens, Attica. Uh, also, we have the total daily energy consumption for the different measures. We have the um, techno-economic analysis for different indices, as you can see here. We have the net present value, the payback period, and the levelized cost of saved energy. And we did also a concrete uh, development of recommendations for the Greek uh, funding program for residential buildings, Exikonomo, for this specific pilot here in this build. So you can already maybe write your questions in uh, the chat, but um, I think I will proceed with the demo because you will understand a bit better the service and then you can ask me or write your questions. Okay, let me share now the demo. I can hear the audio of the of the ah. them. I think that you should share the sound also. Mm. Okay, let me see. Sure. Okay. Thank you for noticing. I think now it will work. Let me know if it doesn't. And my name is Dimitra Zanev from ICP. <laughs> Here we show you the energy efficiency financing service. In this service, what we do is that we use the DREAM model in order to assess the energy savings from different energy efficiency actions. 
Afterwards, we conduct an economic assessment in order to assess the economic benefits from these actions. And as a final step, we suggest different financing options and policy recommendations for the building users. This is the model interface, which I'm going to dive a bit more into here. As you can see here, for example, for the pilot here in Attica, we have used different scenarios. This is the baseline one. We have one using a gas boiler. Wind renovation, walls, or the complete envelope. Today we will show you the results from the baseline, comparing it to the completely envelope renovation. Here is the other fish as we show it. Here we import the weather data. For example, here we have included the weather data for specifically the Athens. We have an occupancy profile where we have included the activities from the different building users. Here we have the HVAC systems where we can provide the different efficiency of the cooling and the heating system. And uh, the most basic, let's say, component of here is this, um, is this module here. We can indicate the different uh, attributes of the building envelope, such as the windows, the roof, the floor area, and also their resistances, which change depending on the material, on the insulation, etc. Um, this is also the case for the um, complete envelope renovation, where we have changed these attributes having more efficient ones for the complete envelope. Here we have uh, already conducted the two simulations, one for the baseline and one having the envelope completely, let's say, renovated. Uh, here the results are um, on, um, on time, here on the here axis, and we have a complete one for example, 365 days. And we also have the energy consumption into kilowatt hours. And this one is our heating consumption in total uh, for the baseline. And this one, we can see the huge difference is our heating consumption for the renovated apartment. Uh, this line here is about the appliances, which remains the same for both cases because we do not change anything in the appliances section for this application. And this one is the cooling for the baseline. And this is the cooling for the renovated apartment, where again, we can see that there is a huge change. So this is the results that uh, we extract with the Python code here from the model. And after we have extracted uh, these specific results, we provide back to the user um, these diagrams with the total energy consumption and the difference between the measures per year, also having them disaggregated to thermal and cooling one, and also the difference in the total uh, daily energy consumption. As a final step then, we conduct the economic assessment uh, here you can see, for example, the result for this specific application. And then we also suggest them different programs and different financing options that they can use uh, for the specific building and country characteristics. Uh, this is all from my side. Thank you very much. And so, yes, this is all from my side. Again, from here, I'm, I'm here for any questions you might have. And, of course, you can also write them in the chat and, and I can come back to you. Okay, so if anyone has a question, please uh, start it, take the floor. It's your turn with the next uh, service. <clears throat> okay, can you see my screen? Yes. <clears throat> So I'm Stas Tamatopoulos from the National Technical University of Athens, and I am a PhD student and researcher. Uh, today I will present your solution designed to navigate the evolving climate challenges of our built environment. Uh, as we stand here, we are witnessing a paradigm shift in climate patterns. Uh, the weather is not only changing, but it's becoming more extreme and unpredictable. Uh, we are seeing more frequent and it is weather events, and this trend is projected to continue. But this is not just a matter of statistics and forecast. Uh, it's about safety of our communities and the integrity of our buildings. So, uh, overseeing uh, uh, 
uh, this challenge, uh, we found out an increased uh, necessity for our communities, communities to safeguard the building stock from these events and reduce the economic burden of post-disaster recovery. To meet these needs, we developed a tool for accurate evaluation of climate resilience in buildings, uh, giving, of course, an actionable insight tailored to each specific building. Uh, this, tools, uh, this tool also offers uh, a comprehensive understanding of, uh, uh, of building vulnerabilities, uh, helping uh, stakeholders to pinpoint where improvements uh, are most uh, needed. All these can be exploited from the users through a user-friendly analytical tool, ensuring accessibility to all stakeholders, uh, of course, regardless uh, of their technical expertise. Uh, at the heart of our service lies uh, our innovative and detailed scoring system, which is in-depth and location-specific assessment that considers uh, uh, local climate risks. Uh, this intuitive uh, web-based tool we've developed does not require, of course, a degree in engineering or a background in climate science, and it is designed for usability, delivering complex data analysis uh, through a simple and clear uh, user interface. So proceeding with our methodology uh, uh, is based in two uh, main analyses. One is the climate exposure analysis, with, in, with which we are trying to identify the exposure to six certain climate hazards, as you can see, heat wave, drought, flooding, storm, storms, heavy precipitation, and cold waves of the building under assessment. And we are using this exposure analysis by calculating some weights in our scoring system. Uh, our scoring system is based on, uh, a, it analyzes six main domains of the building, the building envelope, the energy systems, the resilience practices, the sustainability practices, the water systems, and the sandy location of the building. Uh, so, but uh, we request from the user to provide us information regarding uh, certain uh, characteristic of each domain uh, as you can see in the envelope uh, column, uh, we uh, seek for, uh, for information regarding the walls, the, uh, the internal insulation, the roof insulation, uh, the window wall ratio, the glazing system, the external insulation, and the shutter, and etc. Uh, for the others, for the other domains. So, uh, having this information, we are trying to understand uh, uh, how much climate resilient like a building is against this hazard. As you can see in the results, uh, we can have an, a clear understanding uh, uh, of uh, how this resilience score is, uh, can be breaking down. And of course, receive um, insights regarding each domain of the building. As you can see, how resilient is our building envelope, our, our energy systems, uh, and stuff like that. Moving on, we can see here an overview of our web tool and its interface. Uh, as you can see, the user has the ability to, um, uh, to, um, to see multiple buildings and uh, their overall scores, and of course have a, an overall dashboard um, uh, that can receive insights regarding uh, the climate resilience of them. Of course, he can receive the exposure analysis and the climate resilience analysis of, the, of, of this building or, or multiple buildings. And I would like to proceed with a demonstration of uh, our, um, our tool. And of course, later on, uh, we can proceed with questions and comments. So I'll start the demonstration. DigiBuild offers a building resilience assessment tool for decision-making support and energy efficiency improvement. This service can provide users with information regarding their building's climate resilience and how exposed they are to specific climate hazards. The service also enables users to understand their building's vulnerabilities and help them make informed decisions about possible upgrades. When entering the app, the user is first requested to sign in. After that, the user is greeted with the app's main dashboard. Here, the user can add new buildings or view and update previous ones. On the right side, the user can examine their building's overall resilience scores and compare the buildings with each other. 
When clicking on Add a Building, the user is prompted to provide some general information about the building. To expedite the process, let's take a look at a previously added building. On the first tab, the user can view the building's general information and delete the building if needed. On the next tab, the user is asked to complete a questionnaire regarding the weather condition in the building's location. This information is crucial for evaluating the building's resilience as it helps assess its exposure to various climate hazards. This in turn allows the algorithm to adjust the weights for each hazard when evaluating the building, ultimately enhancing the accuracy of the assessment. While the questionnaire is designed to be user-friendly, in the future users will also have the option to upload weather data and skip this step. Moving forward, the user can review the results of the questionnaire. On the left side, the user can see the risk associated with each hazard affecting the building, while on the right, the exposure can be visualized using a radar chart. This information plays a vital role in evaluating the building's ability to withstand these hazards. The next step involves providing information about the building's specific characteristics. The user must select the appropriate components for each of the provided categories to facilitate the assessment. These categories and characteristics are designed to be easy to fill without requiring expert knowledge, yet they are detailed enough to provide an accurate assessment. Once all the characteristics are selected, the user can proceed to view the results. The overall resilience score is displayed at the top left. Additionally, the user can view the scores for each of the categories separately, gaining insights into the building's vulnerabilities and areas where potential improvements can be made. On the right, there are two plots. In the upper one, the user can see the weighted results for each hazard, which describe how resilient the building is against its hazard while taking into account the weather conditions of the building's location. In the lower plot, the total resilience for each hazard is displayed without custom weights. This tool is expected to assist users in better understanding the hazards most likely to affect their building and assessing the building's vulnerability when exposed to these hazards. This way, users can gain insights into the building's vulnerabilities and can then make informed decisions about how to enhance the building's resilience. Thank you for watching. Teachbuild offers a building resilience. Well, thank you for watching. We can now proceed uh, with the questions part. If there are any questions, please feel free, feel free to write it on the chat. Okay, mm, I think that we can uh, move on uh, with the digital twin presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, studies. <laughs> okay, so Marilena, yes, I leave the floor to you for the um, you. cloud based DigiBill data toolbox presentation. Thank, thank you. you. So let me share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen, the presentation mode? Yes, Marilena. Okay, thank you. thank you. Good morning. My name is Marilena. I'm Marilena Lazar from Engineering Technical Manager, Project Manager. I'm involved in DigiBuild project because I'm responsible for the work package for developing the digital twins. In this presentation, I will provide you, first of all, the concept of digital twin, how we have defined digital twins in the in the context of the project, and I will provide you, of course, an overview of the digital twin services that we have developed, underlining the key features, so the main 
functionality that our digital twins are able to provide and the benefit, of course, for the building or the district eating and for the end users. So the digital twins concept, first of all, uh, this concept is a novelty in the energy domain uh, because it's, it's come basically from the manufacturing, from the industry uh, domain. Uh, we started from the literature and we know that there is a difference between a digital model, a digital shadow and a digital twin. The main difference is uh, about the interaction between the physical and the digital entities. In case this interaction is a two-way automatic interaction, we can talk of digital twins. Otherwise, we will have a digital model as a copy of a potential physical entity, but without any data exchange between the physical and the virtual ob objects and uh, the digital, digital sh the shadows. In, the case, in this case, we have a one-way interaction where the physical system updates the digital model, but uh, Again, this is just one interaction from the physical object to the digital from the physical object to the digital object, and the control is not uh, is not achieved. We have also a definition coming from the Digital Twin Consortium that uh, um, define the digital twin as a virtualized representation of the real world entities and processes that is synchronized with again a specified frequency and fidelity. Uh, the digital twin in the context of DigiBuild is conserved, of course, of the virtual counterpart of the physical system. The main characteristic of the digital twin is that relying on real-time historical data in order to present the past and the present works as a simulation environment for machine learning optimization techniques. This means that the services that you uh, have the clear understanding coming from the other presentation are exploded inside the digital twin. Digital twins also uh, uh, can act as a control instance of the instance of the physical pro uh, object. In this case, this is important to underline that we could have uh, um, a different, uh, uh, how can I say, a different uh, level of maturity in case uh, the control, uh, the, there is the possibility of control the physical object. We can talk about uh, a level of maturity of four. And this control can be uh, done through the digital twin in a manually or automatical way. Of course, this means that the interaction uh, of the end user with the digital twin is more advanced. Uh, digital twin services developed inside the project are based on high quality data and data driven services. We develop digital twins in order to design feature building and mainly for managing their efficiency through an optimal energy management, optimizing building renovation strategies, and we are also develop digital twin for district eating in order to have an efficient management and operation. Last but not least, we have also digital building logbook that are uh, not exactly classified as the digital twins, but they are of course useful in the context of the digital twin uh, services. This is an overview of all services that we have developed. So Digital Twin for Design and Feature Building, this kind of services is mainly applied in the Focke pilot. In this case, we have already an existing Digital Twin development of level three, and the aim of the project is to reach a level four. So we, we would like to have the possibility through the Digital Twin to the building manager, to the facility manager, to control the physical uh, instances of the of the Focke pilot. The digital twin for optimal energy management, this service is applied in two pilot, the emotion and the iron pilot. Uh, we will reach a level of maturity of three. We don't have a previous development for both pilot. Digital twin for planning uh, or building infrastructure. This uh, is mainly um, uh, development mainly apply, applied in IDF pilot, in which we have uh, an already existing digital twin development with a level of two, and we will, would like to um, reach a level of three, so an operational efficiency. 
This digital twin and this network digital twin that are mainly applied in UCL and Veolia Palo with a level of three and four of maturity. Again, level three means operational efficiency, level four means remote and immersive operation control through the digital uh, representation of the physical object. Okay, going in detail of the development that we have in, in the project, so the digital twin for the sanificial building in case of Focchi. Focchi is an Italian company. Inside the company area, there is the office building and the factory where the uh, whole assembly process of the fracked system take place. This uh, pilot is also equipped with the photovoltaic system. The main feature provided by the digital twin are the uh, building 3D visualization. Of course, we have the connection with the uh, building IoT equipment. Uh, so the digital twin is fed by real-time data. We, in we, are, uh, we are integrating the advanced analytics services for the energy comfort and well-being. Um, the digital twins works as anomaly detection system uh, with the goal to uh, to trigger alert when some um, abnormal, abnormal condition like the, the failures in the equipment are discovered. And it works, uh, works also as an as optimization of the energy consumption, taking in account the user comfort. This is uh, the case of applying, um, in the reality, the user co the, 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 the comfort services uh, showed before by, by Victoria. And uh, uh, the comfort itself is, uh, uh, is monitored, but is required an explicit feedback by, uh, by the occupants, which are the main benefit. Of course, the improvement of the building energy efficiency and the carbon footprint reduction, focusing on the benefit that these digital twins provide to the, uh, to the end user. We have the facility and the building manager that uh, through the anomaly detection system can of course identify areas where some, uh, uh, some issues are uh, discovered, but of course they can also identify areas in which the energy consumption can be reduced without sacrificing the user comfort and uh, productivity. The dashboard also provides by the digital twin is able to integrate a different kind of data. So and one, uh, one tool for providing uh, the relevant information for the facility and the building manager. Iron. Iron is a Greek company, a Greek power company. Uh, the pilot uh, consists in different buildings. Here, the goal uh, is to develop digital twins for designing future building. The actual development has a, a metric page in which uh, the end user can access to both real time and historical data. A prediction system of carbon footprint intensity for each building is provided, and this digital twins works also as a decision support system with the aim to suggest to the manager when will be the best moment to charge the AV in order to support the grid reducing CO2 emission, of course. Indeed, the main benefit of these digital twins is the improvement of energy efficiency in residential building. We will be able to anticipate the building environment impact and plan it accordingly. The facility manager can, of course, plan the V charging session in the optimal way, and the building manager can have a clear understanding of the actual building situation through the monitoring page. EMOT. EMOT is another case study that we have uh, for uh, the development of digital twin for design in future building. Emotion is an Italian company specialized in a charging station for EVs and has set its insight on developing the digital twin system to efficiently manage and optimize the energy consumption of one of its building. Um, the digital twin uh, provides a monitoring system, a forecasting system, and mainly a simulation environment in order to manage the EV charging based on uh, the possibility to balance the, the PV production and the building consumption. In this case, we will be able to reach a level of maturity of for because through the digital twin, 
the, uh, the, the, the end user will be able also to control remotely the AV charging station according to the suggestion provided by the optimization services integrated in the digital twin. The, the digital twins works also as a decision support system for electrical and thermal load management. So the benefit can be summarized as follow, reduction of the overall energy cost by uh, using uh, the power, the energy power uh, uh, through the, the PV, uh, the photovoltaic system, uh, reduction of the carbon footprint. Uh, what about the end user? The end user in this case are the AV fleet, the charging station manager that can uh, use the optimization results in order to set automatically the, uh, the scheduling of the AV charging and the facility manager can access to the list of suggestions of, uh, of action in order to achieve the electrical thermal load management. In this case, uh, we, we talk about uh, suggestion because it, it is not possible to apply the remote control manually or uh, automatically through the digital system. So we are going to show a list of set points that then the facility manager can evaluate to apply or not. ADF. ADF is another case study of digit build. In this case, we are going to develop a digital twin for better informed planning of building infrastructure. ADF Electricity de France is the largest energy producer and distributor in France. And the pilot is uh, um, related to an old building belonging to the ADF Research Center. The digital twins uh, um, is about the 3D visualization of the building and works also as a simulation tool to predict the thermal behavior of the building. But the main characteristic of, the, of this digital twin is that uh, it, it is about the decision support tool to plan building renovation, uh, assessing the impact on thermal comfort and energy needs. Basically, different renovation scenarios are proposed to the, end, to the end user taking in account uh, the impact also on thermal comfort and the energy needs. The benefit, again, the a possibility to estimate and optimize the cost uh, and the impact of future building renovation action, uh, determining uh, which is the best uh, renovation plan according to some specific API. Of course, uh, the cost is one of the factor that is taken in account because we are talking about building renovation. Stakeholders that are involved in the different renovation solution like uh, replacement uh, or the defect system or uh, something like that, are uh, involved in the process and can, um, can access to the different renovation plan through the proper report that is provided through the digital twin. Digital building logbook. Uh, the concept of digital building logbook is usually associated to the digital twin because it works as a booster of digital twin construction. We have a development in digit build. Uh, it works as a tool for building stakeholders uh, because it uh, it is a basically a web application providing in one only place uh, all relevant building information like the administrative information or the building operation use that are usually uh, provided by different uh, tools. Um, and mainly the novelty that we have in DigiBuild for this development is about the integration of AI-based services for answer comfort, comfort and well-being. The benefit is, of course, the possibility to bring together all building information in a user-friendly tool. The specific building information are provided to the end user according to the specific role. So this means that if I am a building manager, I will have a look to the specific information information if I am responsible for the equipment, I will uh, asset only to the information related to the equipment. If I'm a facility manager, I'm interested in uh, improving the comfort of having information about the comfort of the building, I will access to the results of the comfort services. Um, the information is uh, uh, automatically updated. So this is also a benefit coming from this, uh, from this tool. 
um, DG build, digital twin for energy efficient building and scale management operation. This is another, another category of the digital twin that we are going to develop in DG build. In the case of University uh, College of London, UCL, um, relies, uh, on, we rely on a campus of uh, 200 of buildings uh, of various uses. In the frame object of the project, two buildings are considered, a residential facility and a teaching research building that are, again, enhanced by the digital twin development. Also, in this case, we have 3D building, is a 3D building visualization with the aim of showing real-time historical data and also the information about the temperature and, all, and other relevant environment parameters. Um, the Digital Twins works as an anomaly detection system uh, supporting the facility manager to understand if there are some uh, failure in the, in the temperature fraction, for example, and works as a what-if simulation environment in order to evaluate the impact operational parameters change will have uh, again on the sustainability but of course also taking account the well begin metrics the benefit for the building is the optimization of its operation the benefit for the facility manager this one of the stakeholders of this digital twin is to know uh, the overall story of the building, the current and the past operational aspects through um, a 3D visualization that can uh, can underline also which are the the other issue that can have, that we can in the in the building again regarding the, the failure system. The facility manager, of course, can take in account this information through this digital twin. The Veolia case, uh, in this, ca in this uh, pilot, uh, Veolia is an energy company in Spain. And uh, we are talking about two district heating, uh, named CP Fasa and Rio Vena. Both are located in Spain. And uh, the digital twin, in this case, is developed for a district heating. The digital twin for a district heating works as a simulation environment for optimizing the district heating of uh, um, energy efficiency. In this case, we are integrating the services for district heating optimization um, that was mentioned before by Andrea. And we uh, provide a dashboard for the facility manager, the district manager, to show all relevant information related to the district, like uh, real time and historical information. The benefit, of course, the increasing of energy efficiency in order to reduce the energy cost and supply the heat in the East district, the facility manager can smartly access to or relevant data of the district, historical real-time data, and control the network for uh, the optimal, uh, for achieving the optimal uh, performance itself. This is the overview of what we are going to develop in the digital twin. We are we have different uh, digital twin already available. Today I'm going to show you two demonstration. One for the district case for the Veolia um, pilot, and the other one for the Iron case that is mainly a digital twin for the sunny future building. So. Let me, okay, this is the first demo. As the user reaches the login page of Digital Twin, he will be required to select the key clock type of authentication in the button here, since it is the one integrated in the access manager of the project. He will be redirected to the login page of, uh, of the access manager, and simply by inserting username and password, he will be granted access to the Digital Twin.
After the login, the login, the home page corresponds to the data page. Here we have some relevant metrics of the district. For Yovena, uh, data stored once per day, but in this case, uh, we have collected and displayed a couple of months of data. All of these data are reported here to enable the district heating network manager to have a clear situation of the district is managing. In the monitoring bar, which is the upper part of the dashboard, we have some relevant metrics that describes the overall situation of the district. Uh, for instance, we have the total gas consumption for the, for the selected period, two uh, maximum supply and return temperatures of the district, and three uh, of the mean supply temperatures of the boilers associated with the district. Uh, in this case, boiler three is uh, for these periods was used uh, was used less than the other two boilers, so uh, the temperature is lower. Below, we have three plots that show the trends of some significant variables. In this case, uh, uh, we have uh, selected the supply uh, return the comparison between the supply and return temperatures of the district. The a plot uh, showing the supply temperatures of uh, of the boilers. And the last plot showing the comparison between the supply and return temperatures of boiler one and boiler two for the selected period. To zoom in a selected period, the user simply has to select a slice of the plot to, to, to highlight the situation during, during the selected time slot. Opening the simulation page, the user will automatically launch an optimization process. As you can see, no data are depicted as of now since the optimization is, uh, uh, is running. Once the simulation process has ended, we have the results of service 3.2.2. On the bottom panel, the district heating manager will see boiler set, up set point temperatures suggested by the optimization algorithm. This, was the sole, this is the sole adjustable parameter uh, to ensure that boiler efficiency is maximized, which is the primary aim of the optimization service. The manager will see in the top bar some significant outcomes, for instance, the comparison of the actual gas consumption with the gas consumption once the strategy is applied. Here we have also the percentage of saved cost and the saved gas consumption. In this moment, the algorithm runs on historical data, but in the next version, the manager will know the optimal temperatures for the future 24 hours. Finally, the results are summarized in a table reported in the dashboard for completeness. Here, the user can find all the relevant data used and produced as a result of service 3.2.2. Following the algorithm set suggested set point temperatures, basing on the results from historical data, uh, it's been demonstrated that uh, we can have a significant reduction in gas consumption compared to the baseline scenario, uh, yielding both the cost savings and a decrease in CO2 emissions. Okay, let's proceed with the Huron demonstration. Welcome to the demo of the Huron Digital Twin, a 2D dashboard digital twin of maturity level three, enriched with real-time sensor data and machine learning business intelligence layers, making it a comprehensive tool for building monitoring and the management of building sustainability and efficiency. Let's deep dive into the key features of this platform. Facility managers can effortlessly monitor buildings, sensors, as well as KPIs, such as carbon footprint, energy consumption, and PV energy production, all in real time. Let's break down each of these metrics to understand their significance. Starting from the left, we first have overall metadata. In this case, there are a total of 19 different sensors across nine buildings. In the middle, we have carbon footprint intensity which represents the environmental impact of your building operations. Unlike traditional methods that focus on individual buildings, this platform calculates the carbon footprint of the entire pilot, encompassing all buildings and activities of the current hour. Next to carbon footprint intensity, we have EV charger energy consumption, which is the total energy consumed by EV charging stations of the pilot. By tracking kilowatt hours used from midnight up to this very moment, you can gain insights into charging patterns and optimize energy usage for maximum efficiency. Finally, we have REST production, which represents the energy generated by communal renewable energy assets. By monitoring kilowatt hour production from midnight up to this very moment, you can gauge the effectiveness of your renewable energy initiatives and contribute to a more sustainable future. 
Moving on, we have the metrics page where users can access real-time data and historical trends for various sensors connected to various devices inside of their buildings. Here, you can select a building and drill down to specific sensors to monitor their real-time readings and metadata. Every sensor contains same metadata. When was it last updated? Is it active? Which device is it connected to? And a brief description, as well as attributes of the sensor. By querying sensors within a building, you can visualize historical data trends, enabling better insights into energy consumption patterns and performance. You simply select the time frame, select the device, and select the attributes you're interested in seeing visualized. And all you really have to do is select the exact attributes that you would like to see or compare, as we see in this case where we are comparing the three energy attributes of the device. This platform also allows you to query multiple sensors at the same time. Perhaps you have two different sensors which are of the same kind, but connected to two different devices, and you would like to see the trends for both sensors for a certain period of time to enable better decision-making. Now let's move to the forecast page, where our building intelligence algorithms come into play. Here you can view predictions of carbon footprint intensity for each building per hour, helping you anticipate environmental impact and plan accordingly. And this is where this platform comes ahead of state-of-the-art technologies, because unlike other technologies that simply offer predictive forecasting, our platform does the planning for you in the recommendations page using complex machine learning algorithms to help you achieve your goals of carbon-free future. By clicking on the eye icon, you can access both building carbon intensity predictions and recommended plans for charger usage, optimizing energy consumption in alignment with our forecasts. Now this platform is still in development. Further improvements include cross-building multi-sensor querying, where you will be able to query different sensors across different buildings, as well as historical querying for EV charger energy consumption and historical querying of the PV energy production. In addition to that, implementation of the simulation engine is scheduled ahead of us where the facility manager will be able to simulate certain data in order to gain insights about the behavior of the pilot if certain situations come about. And lastly, already developed rule engine will be integrated where a facility manager will be able to set certain rules on either sensors or KPIs and be immediately notified via email or text if certain thresholds have been reached. Okay. okay. So thank you. I don't know if you have uh, any question. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Marilena. For questions for the previous uh, presentation, you can put it in the slide, in the sorry, in the chat. So, uh, Nina, that's your turn with the with the survey on social acceptance. So, to the audience, please uh, take note to the concepts that now Nina will uh, introduce you, and uh, she will also share with you the link for the uh, survey that we ask kindly ask you to 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 fill in. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Victoria. Good morning. My name is Nina Costa. Um, I'm working uh, on the DigiBuild project under a company called Seaware. And uh, now we'll be looking at something completely different, but uh, related to all the services you've heard about. Um, Victoria, can you see my screen? Yes, but... Not, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now I've turned it into Perfect. presentation mode. 
Okay, um, as, as Victoria pointed out, um, the interaction with the users has been very important under the DigiBuild project. And so to add another dimension to our user engagement, what we would like to do is also judge um, the social acceptance of the DigiBuild technologies that are being used. Um, so as you see um, in many of the examples presented today, um, there is extensive digitalization within the building sector, the sector and build environment and the use of advanced data sciences, um, especially the use of digital twins, which Marilena has outlined for you in great detail. And then also the extensive use, we also make extensive use of machine learning. Um, and um, machine learning, of course, is part of a much bigger field of artificial intelligence. So um, at the end of my presentation, I will give you a link to a questionnaire. And um, I would like to encourage you to please answer these questions for us to get a handle on the social acceptance aspect. So, um, as you've seen, many of the digi digital, uh, sorry, DigiBuild services will utilize di digital twins, and that's um, either representation of the buildings per se, or in this in this project, also representation of district meeting uh, heating networks. Um, digital, digital, the project mainly uses machine learning because we've got huge amounts of data that are coming from the building sensors and um, the building information management systems. And the purpose of this, of course, is to uh, improve the building performance and especially the energy efficiencies, carbon um, emission reduction, etc. So um, today you've already heard about many of the models that have been used in DigiBuild, for example, for comfort or lots of algorithms also for optimization of, of various aspects and as well as um, the data quality checking. This is all run automatically um, and based on algorithms and uh, different machine learning techniques. Um, now, I just want to try and put machine learning into the bigger picture of artificial intelligence. Um, so I've just added a simple definition of artificial intelligence, um, and um, I think you're all aware of that already. But when we start having look, if we start and look at the world of artificial intelligence, it's getting very complex in nature. So I've managed to find this analysis where they um, separate artificial intelligence into two types. Uh, one, one categorization is based on the capabilities of um, AI, and the other type is based on the functionalities of AI. Now, I don't want to, to go into the type two too much today, but i just like to give you an overview of where the DigiBuild services sit uh, within the type one, um, uh, the types of artificial intelligence of type one. Okay, so they've, they've put it, uh, define three different categories of artificial intelligence, um, narrow artificial intelligence, general, and super. Um, now, narrow artificial intelligence is um, artificial intelligence that performs a specific task or a limited range of tasks. And this relates mostly to the machine learning algorithms and um, the models which are also trained. 
Um, general artificial intelligence is also known as strong artificial intelligence, and that's designed to perform tasks that humans can do. And we know that already through our usage of um, technologies like Siri on the iPhone, um, Alexa, or ChatGPT. And then there's a, another category called Super I, um, AI. And this is most, at this stage, this is a hypothetical form of AI because um, they envisage that at some point this super AI will be able to surpass our human intelligence. Um, that's a completely different uh, angle to go in. So what I'd like to point out here that in uh, the context of digital services, it is mostly the narrow AI that is being applied to um, offer the services. So now just to come to the, the survey that we would like to undertake, um, we'd like to get your opinion of the use of these technologies within the built environment. Um, I've put the link of the survey um, on my slide, but also in the chat of um, the meeting. Um, if possible, I think, because if you close this Zoom meeting, you will lose the chat. So um, maybe I can also ask uh, Marietta, who organized this meeting, to send this link out by email to all the participants today. So the survey will take about uh, 10 minutes of your time. And we will definitely keep all the responses anonymous. In fact, in the survey, you will see that we don't even ask for your name or contact details, um, only if you would like to get um, see the results of the survey, then you can leave us an email address. So originally, I thought we'd uh, give you some time during this meeting to fill in um, the survey, but I think we're already overrunning on time a little bit, so um, I don't think that's going to be possible, but I would like to encourage you to complete it, you know, straight after this meeting, but um, the survey will also be open for another week, and if you could please find the time during the next week. Uh, to give us your feedback on this. And so thanks very much for your attention and I thank you in advance for completing this uh, survey for us and I'll hand you back to Victoria now. Okay. Thank you, Nina. So uh, I hope that everyone has access to the to the survey. And um, am I right? Let's wait uh, like some minutes uh, to see if some response uh, are already uh, arriving. Otherwise, yeah, as uh, Nina suggested, uh, obviously the audience can uh, um, perfectly fill in the the survey offline, but uh, with uh, uh, one week of time being. Yeah. So let's wait uh, some minutes and uh, then the um, workshop will end. Uh, obviously, if there are some uh, curiosities, some doubts, uh, some questions about everything, about DigiBuild, about the services and how we implement them, Please uh, provide your uh, questions, uh, ask everything you want. We are here. And uh, or we you can also reach us uh, by email for sure. So let's wait some minutes and then we will conclude the, the session. Thank you. Um, can I request if anyone would prefer to um, receive this by email, if you can just put that in the chat and then we can get an idea of we if we do an email broadcast of the survey link as well. Is 
Is anyone having problems as accessing the survey? If they can also let us know, please. I'm not seeing any chat messages coming through. Is there an issue with the chat or not? I think, Nina, that they are fine. Be uh, for example, I can access the, um, the survey it's from survey. the chat. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so please, yeah, could you, could you set aside 10 minutes to fill this in and uh, give us your feedback? That would be most useful. Okay, Nina, I read your message. So we can uh, close the meeting actually. So because um, it is actually better to fill in the, the survey offline so that everyone can also um, be more uh, uh, confident with all the uh, concepts that we have actually uh, proposed to you during these two hours meeting. I hope that everyone has enjoyed this meeting and uh, that we have been clear uh, as regards the importance of user engagement in DigiBuild in our project and in all our activities. So please uh, remember to fill in the survey of Nina, the social acceptance one, so that we can also measure this kind of uh, this kind of uh, metric. For us, it is uh, really important, and uh, uh, we will keep updated uh, as soon as possible about that. So uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you to Eurohit for organizing this uh, this meeting, and uh, yeah. That's all from my side.
Thank you, Victoria. Yeah, thanks, Thank Victoria. you all.